Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 40th episode of VisionCon Live, your go-to nerdy talk show. I'm your host, Zach Wilson, but you didn't come here to see me today. You came to see the man of the hour. He's Mikado from Durarara, A. Maimon from Blue Exorcist, Hakiru from Magi, just to name a few. He's a legendary actor who's captivated audience for decades. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Daryl Gilbo. Daryl, how you doing today? Good, how are you? How's everybody out there? I'm doing dandy as candy, and I hope everybody watching right now is doing just as dandy. But uh, I, for those of you who missed the pre-show, uh, we did Icebreakers, yes. and I will say, Daryl, you really roll with the punches, because again, if you missed it, I asked him if he were convicted of capital punishment, what his last meal would be. He said boiled crawfish, just like off that. Yeah, I didn't have to think about it. It was it was tip of, tip of my tongue. It was right there at the forefront. Oh my God, it was very impressive, because usually when I ask that question, I can see in my guests' eyes that their first thought is, we're not even in, in like, we're not even starting this interview yet, and this guy's already asking me uh, what I would eat before I got killed. Uh, so no, you were just right there. I really, uh, really respect that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm salivating right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, acting jobs aside, yes. Daryl, like I said, you're a legendary actor, you know, given your own professional spin on things for decades. But what I want to know to start us all out is, was this always the plan or did something happen later in life that kind of brought you to be such a titan in the entertainment industry? Um, well, I always wanted to be an actor, but um, did I know the plan or how it would end up or, or anything like that? No. I had, you know, no clue what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> you know, I still don't. <laughs> and uh, um, I mean, uh, just coming out to LA to be an actor is what I wanted to do. And I went to acting school. Um, I mean, I, you know, yes, I had a plan to a certain degree, but sure. I did not know the twists and turns and the, the, the road it would take, you know, to get where I am, uh, as well as God knows where it's going. <laughs> Sure. Well, there have been many roles that you've done throughout the years that have definitely put you onto the map. And I wanted to talk about three of them that I've kind of briefly mentioned in the intro. The first one being the one that a lot of people are probably here watching right now, either live here on Facebook or later on YouTube. That, of course, is Mikado from Dorarara. So Mikado, there's a lot to unpack with Mikado, both good and bad in his character traits. But I first wanted to ask you, what was kind of your experience voicing Mikado? Well, you know, in the beginning, um, I auditioned for Mikado and for uh, Masomi. Okay. So I didn't know which one, of course, I would, I would get, if any. Sure. And I was told I didn't get any of those roles. Really? And, yeah. So I think they recorded the first episode with someone else. And then I got a call later on. Now, I didn't know this until like way after I had recorded all these, the first season, I think. And then I found out someone else had previously done, they, they hired someone else. And then they decided, I guess just the voice didn't match or whatever. But I, that's how I ended up getting Mikado. Um, it was a second choice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is fine with me. I'll be a hundredth choice. I'll take it. Sure. And, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, my experience was when I first started voicing Mikado, because you know, the very, very first episode, when he, he's sort of this innocent guy who's country kid, who is going to the big city, you know, Tokyo, and uh, the, the special neighborhood of Ikibukuro, and he's meeting all these weird characters, you know, in the show, by, you know, little by little, as um, his friend Masomi is walking him through, uh, meets him at the train station. And, and walking him through the town. So I'm, I thought, well, I guess Mikado is just gonna be sort of this innocent kid with no secrets that everybody else is gonna be kind of the crazy ones with the, you know, all the, the sure. details of their lives. So of course, as I went on, uh, the realization that, whoa, Mikado has a lot more going on with him. And especially as you get, I'm not gonna give any spoilers, but of course, especially as you get to the end of the second season, um, yeah. So, <laughs> which on that note, because yes, and obviously not to spoil anything for anybody who hasn't watched Arara, though if you haven't already, please do. Highly recommend. 
a big character v- development and you know plot twists galore, yeah. especially for yeah. Mikado during the first season and especially during the second yeah. season. But because he's such a dynamic character who goes through all of this character development and growth, was there ever a point playing Dor- or uh, not Dorara, playing Mikado mm-hmm. where you kind of found that you started to relate to him in a bit? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I always feel like any character I do, especially I think once I start getting into maybe the second uh, episode, there becomes more of a um, a connection because you're starting to know who this person is. And I try to find different things about myself that I can relate to in each character I do, no matter who, what it is. And with Mikado, I think I started um, connecting sort of with his awkwardness socially in, in school okay. because I was not a you know popular kind of guy I was quiet you know I was kind of a shy kid you know sort of like Mikado Mm -hmm. and so I could relate to that you know and sort of how he looked up to his friend Masomi who was you know a a bit more devil may care you know (laughs) sort of the cool guy right sure and so I was not that Mm -hmm. and neither was Mikado so Mm -hmm. I could definitely definitely relate Mm -hmm. to, to that in the beginning well, I mean, it's definitely great that you related to that versus, you know, what happens later. Yes. <laughs> but on that note... Maybe I can. <laughs> well, I was about to say, the day's still young. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of moving on to a bit of a character that's definitely a bit more out there and a bit, you know, it can be a little bit more menacing, especially on a surface level. That, of course, is Amemon from Blue Exorcist, a name that I can never pronounce correctly. Yes. But, um... <laughs> But so, kind of, what was your experience voicing Amemon? And kind of, was there ever a point while kind of playing him where, because Amemon is definitely a character who, even in a show as dark as Blue Exorcist, can definitely go to places that, you know, are even more darker. So was that ever a challenge uh, voicing him as, you know, a professional actor? Well, I think it's called Amemon. There it is. See, always <laughs> mispronounce it. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, I mean, but you know how I approached him as well was um, Amaimon, okay, he's a demon. He's he's lived his entire existence in Gehenna, you know, with a bunch of other demons. Uh, so his nature is demonic, but yet he has this playful sort of innocent quality about him. I mean, you know, he's a demon that likes lollipops, for crying out loud, right? So, and he likes to play. So I think... As I saw Maimon, he had sort of this quality that even though he was de- demonic, everything to him was a game. So, you know, even if he was going to do the, the most dastardly evil thing, it was still a game to him. So in a way, it was part of his innocence mm. that he didn't even realize his own, I think, darkness. You know, for him, his darkness was light. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? Oh, it definitely does. And I did want to also ask, now in a world that we live in where there seems to be more shown in anime than I have shit behind me, (laughs) do you ever expect a Blue Exorcist to be as popular as it is today? No, I did not. And I also did not expect to see so many Amaimons at anime conventions. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, and that's actually, I think the first time I saw a Maimon at a convention was in Australia. Really? And yeah, and and I think it had just started coming out. And then that's when I said, oh, I think this is going to be kind of big. And then I started seeing a Maimon at other conventions and, you know, was always got great response when I went up to them and said, uh, I'm a Maimon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's definitely a very big character. Uh, I can say that from first ex- first-hand experience because, as you all know, I'm also the MC of Vision Con, so I host the costume contest as well. And whenever somebody comes on there and is cosplaying a Maimon, I always, without fail, and as you guys witnessed like five minutes ago, always mispronounce the name first try. And it, <laughs> without fail, it was a Maimon, a Maimon. <laughs> a Maimon, I believe, was the first time I saw it. But, right. Um, God, it's a wreck. But finally, to round us out in the three characters I wanted to talk about, I did want to talk about Akiru from Magi. So I wanted to ask, first and foremost, what was your experience voicing this character? Magi, of course, is 
also accompanied by its sister story, which is obviously Sinbad, both of which are on Netflix. You guys haven't watched it. But uh, what was your experience voicing the character? Um, I loved voicing him because he had so many layers as well. Um, I mean, when you first meet him, and, and that's what I love to do about characters that uh, later on you see different dimensions of them, sort of when he falls in love with Morgiana. And I love that scene where he's proposing <laughs> to her. <laughs> It is such an amazing scene to do. And then of course, I, I hope I'm not giving stuff away, but of course later on there's things about his family that get really heavy, heavy, heavy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and he, yeah. So not to give any, anything else away that I've already done, <laughs> but yeah, that's, for me as an actor, that's what I like is, is to play characters who have so many, th and who do things you did not maybe even expect that they would do. Oh, no, him especially, because yeah. he goes from super serious and, you know, maybe in the midst of a fight scene, all of a sudden, you know, cracking a joke or blushing because another character kind of embarrassed him. So right. as an actor, is that, was there ever a challenge with that, having such a sudden tone switch? No, I think I love it. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, I love it. Quick, I like, I like Botanate. just flip, flip of the switch, right? I love yeah. that. <laughs> also love that he had the two multicolored eyes. Oh my God, yeah, that was, that was sick. But, you know, throughout that show, and obviously this is, you know, kind of throughout all shown in anime, but I will say Magi definitely does it more than some. With those big fight scenes, I mean, I got to assume that must be taxing on the throat, you know, eventually. So kind of what do you do to either prepare yourself for, you know, a taxing day in the booth or maybe after the fact kind of recover? Well, definitely lots of tea with lemon in the booth. Um, that's, and, I, and I use that uh, singer's voice, you know, for the throat. You can spray yeah, yeah. it in sort of coat. Yeah, and of course you try to use your diaphragm like they say, it doesn't always work. Sometimes your throat cool. gets strained. I'll tell you where it's worst is when you're doing the Dynasty Warriors mm -hmm. video games. Because I've voiced several characters in those. Because they have so many fights, you know, and, and you're having to do just in one attack, in one thing, you're doing uh, light attack, medium attack, heavy attack. And you're starting off like do three light attacks, do three medium attacks, do three heavy <laughs> attacks. So, and it's multiple fights. So you, I, I, I leave that booth after that and I'm, I can't talk. And for those that have never played a Dynasty Warrior game, there's a lot of attacking that goes on. There's a lot of attacking, more, more than Magi, more than Magi. <laughs> All righty, guys, we're kind of at the halfway point. So I did want to mention real quick that if you guys are watching this live here on Facebook, you still have plenty of time to either message VisionCon directly, your viewers' comments and questions, or message it in the live chat right here on Facebook. And so with that said, I want to go into a little bit more in depth to actually the actor role in your job, because you are both an actor and a voice actor. So I did want to ask, are there unique challenges involved uh, with acting versus voice acting, which again are both, you know, two sides of the same coin, but, you know, stage acting and, you know, voice acting, they're, they're different skills that you have to employ in each of them. So are there any of them that are unique to acting that help with voice acting and maybe even vice versa? Um, well, I can wear, one of the differences though, I can wear my tennis shoes and a t-shirt <laughs> and I don't have to worry about what I look like if we're voice acting. <laughs> uh, but how, I think the things that cross over, I think one of the things that helped me the most actually with voice acting uh, was being able to cold read. Oh. And that, a lot, I, I don't hear a lot of people talk about that, but um, a lot of times in auditioning or with, when you first get a script that you've never seen before, you have to be able to, for the very first time, look at those lines and be able to be there without ever seeing them before. And that's what primarily happens with voice acting. You rarely get to see the script ahead of time. So everything you, you're acting, you're seeing for the very first time. And they do not wait for you to read that line, you know, to look, I mean, you might have a little time to, oh, oh okay. Now, you know, you're reliant on what you think is going on as well as what's been going on in the progression of a story and as well as the director's direction of telling you what's actually happening. And when you're looking at the screen and seeing the characters um, uh, react as well as hearing maybe what the Japanese actor did, 
ahead of you because you hear that first. Or if someone, if another person has in character done it, you know, so I mean, all these things kind of play on you. Mm. But you have to be able to, to be able at sight, cold read. And because I've seen people audition sometimes and they're here's your script for the first time and it's, you know, it's, it, it's sort of stilted because you're not used to putting it all in in that very first thing and reacting to the next line that comes towards you. Mm. So anyway, I, I, I think cold reading is very, very important. And I learned that very, very on uh, in, in the acting world, especially in theater. Um, so, and, and if you can get in any kind of in playwriting group where they use actors to cold read, because I did that as well for years, I was part of a wonderful group and would read the actors, I mean, the, the writer's works and that helped with cold reading. Mm. So that way your emotions can be there right on. Mm. Well, like, and going in for your first role in like a voiceover setting, did yes. you ever anticipate that it would be like, that's how it would be conducted or did no. you just, you know? <laughs> No. You, so was rolling with the punches then, especially during the first time, easy or did it definitely take a few tries before you kind of got the hang of it? Um, it took it took a little time to get comfortable with it. Sure. Because um, the very first time I went into audition was for a role. The very first lead character I did was in uh, a series called Overman King Gainer, uh, which is a Tamino who did uh, Mobile Suit Gundam. Uh, this was sort of a lighter, lighter version uh, of his work. But um, I went into audition and I didn't think I was going to get it. So I wasn't really that nervous because I had never done voiceover before. Okay. So, and they told me, don't, I didn't know anything about the beeps. You know, you go into a booth here and have a headphone and beeps and all this stuff. But so they said, we know you've never done this. So don't worry about the beeps. Just we're going to play the Japanese version. Then you're going to hear these beeps, but whenever you're ready, just do the lines. So I said, okay, I'm going to have fun with it because I'm not getting this part. <laughs> and so I did it. And then several months later, I found out that I did get the part. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, but, you know, thank God that it was actually, having that role was like being in class, you know, <laughs> but on the job training, right? Sure. Sure. Kind of get a roll with the punches. Yeah. So it was amazing. Well, kind of similar in that vein. So a lot of people who watch the show obviously are here for the amazing guests like the one right before me. However, a lot of people also watch the show because they either want to get into the entertainment industry, yes. acting, voice acting, what have you, or already are and just kind of want to know what they got to do next to get to the next level. So keep that in mind for these next two questions. The yeah. first of which is I want to know about rejection. Now, obviously, we all know rejection is a big part of life, no matter how you look at it. However, I would argue that if there was ever an industry that rejection is most prevalent, it would definitely be your industry, which is, of course, the entertainment industry. So, Daryl Gilbo, a household name, someone as successful as you are in the acting and voice acting realm, how do you deal with rejection? Does it get any easier? Or if it doesn't, how would you advise the folks watching at home how they can deal with rejection better when it inevitably comes. Uh, I react like this. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, not really. <laughs> on the inside, on the inside. I mean, sure, you gotta let it out sometime. <laughs> well, you know, okay, there is a difference. Like when I was younger, I mean, I totally took the rejection to heart. You know, I wanted any job I auditioned for, I wanted the work so bad. You know, and, and when you didn't hear from anybody, it was just heartbreaking, you know, or you felt like, what did I do wrong? Or is, something, is it me? Is it, what, what should I do next? And all this. Um, and, you know, as I've been doing this for a while, um, I mean, I think rejection is, God, I'm probably 90%, 95% <laughs> of the time. Um, so now I, I guess I just look at it like, uh, if, if I'm meant to get a part, I'm going to get a part. I just go and do the best I can. If I make a mistake, I learn from it, try to, I try to let it go the minute my audition is done. I, I mean, cause really that's the only way to stay sane sure. in this, you know, if you're trying to do anything in the entertainment, you know, whether it's singer, dancer, actor, voiceover, you, you can't just, you know, it'll, it'll drag you down if you, you know, yeah, I think you should acknowledge it. Sure. If you feel that way, you can't just stuff it down, but I think you can't let it, you know, overcome you. 
Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I've learned. I wish I would have known that when I was younger because I would have saved myself probably a lot of heartache. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and a lot of previous guests have said that for voice acting, when you audition for a role, since there are so many people applying for that role, mm-hmm. generally you won't find out that you didn't get the part until the part has been casted. Exactly. So does it, is that a good or a bad thing in your opinion? I mean, I think it's okay. Cause I, like I said, I think you just got to get in that mindset. Like, okay, move on. Sure. And if I get it, they'll, they'll let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I like, I put it aside and I just go on to the next audition or job. If it comes, you know, whatever, whatever. I just try to take it each day, you know, because otherwise I would go nuts. <laughs> Miss every shot you don't take. <laughs> Sorry. Miss every shot you don't take. Exactly. <laughs> but you know, I, I always remember this thing Woody Allen said. No. He said, uh, for, for any audition, just show up. Ooh. You know, and, and I'll give you one quick example. I can. Um, I had an audition for this. Um, okay. Oh, we talked a little earlier about my YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay. I have a little scene on there from a little web series called uh, Bozos. And I had gotten this audition. This was several years ago. And uh, I loved the part. It was a kind of, sort of a crazed, uh, racist ventriloquist. <laughs> and I'm not a ventriloquist, but I thought, oh my God, this is, sounds so fun. And I felt like the character fit me in terms of like he was, the ventriloquist himself was very kind of like a Midwest kind of happy guy. Sure. But his dummy was the bad one. Oh, his dummy was the bad one. Yeah. So... <laughs> And so I kind of got the script, right? And, but the audition was at 8 p.m. What? Yeah, in the evening in the Hollywood area. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm so tired. I don't feel like getting out, you know? And so I just I said, okay, just go. Because I remembered that thing about Woody Allen. I went and I got the part. Heck yeah. And it ended up being such a fun role to do, and I met, and I now I'm still working with the the, the uh, writer and director on, on some uh, other projects. But had that not happened, you know, had I not gone, I wouldn't have gotten it, you oh. know. And, and it ends up these I've known these guys now for years, and they're uh, we're writing together now. So, oh my God, just one door opened uh, after the other. So you all, never know where things are going to take you. All because of a racist ventriloquist dummy. Exactly. So <laughs> go to the YouTube channel and watch. 100%. And on that note, guys, a bunch of links attached to Daryl Gilbo are going to be, if you're watching this live on Facebook, right there in the live chat, or if you're watching this later on YouTube, down there in the description box below. And then next, kind of in a similar vein, for the folks watching at home that are either wanting to get in the entertainment industry or already are and just want to know what they need to do next to get to the next level, what advice would you give them? Possibly some advice that you wish maybe you had starting out. Um, I think I wish... Oh, there's so many things. I, I think I wish I would have gone. I, I, did, I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts um, for two years, which was wonderful. I, but I kind of wish somebody would have led me maybe towards something like, uh, I love the acting program in, uh, at DePaul University uh, because they work, they, have a, they work with a professional uh, company as well in Chicago. But I, I love the, the thought of uh, going through the college um, and then repertory circuit as an actor, which I missed out on. I didn't do that. Um, I, so in the beginning, maybe that. Uh, with voice acting in particular, um, I think I, I wish I would have gotten more advice and sought it out of building my own home studio because I have not done that. And it's so important today to have that. You know, I can, you know, I've recorded a few things at home, you know, nothing really major. Uh, I, I definitely have this stuff to do auditioning from home, but um, eventually I like to get myself together <laughs> and have more of a home studio. Sure. All right, guys. Well, with that, guys, now is your last chance. If you haven't already, plenty of other people have already either messaged VisionCon directly or put their comments and questions in the live chat. You have one last chance to do so because, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the plug zone. Oh, Daryl. Now is your opportunity to yeah. promote, plug, okay. advertise, whatever you want to do. Floor is yours, sir. All right, cool. Well, you know, first I'm going to do something really quick. Um, you know, I have an opportunity for somebody to win something, but oh, not directly. It's through me, but not directly through me. It's there's if you go on Facebook, there's a group called Anime Collectors United. 
Do you know that group? Anime Collectors are United. I don't, but we're yeah. all about to. Give me one sec. Yeah. And I think there's about 800 people in it, give or take. And so I sent them um, two autographed prints that they're going to give away. I don't know exactly when. Uh, they're going to give it away either this month or next. And one of this, this is one of the prints. It's got all my characters on it. You don't have to see this part, but all the characters are there. Um, or uh, I have a great one of just Mikado from Durarara. So, and I have it uh, autographed. So they have it in their possession now. Um, so if you go to that and become a member, um, any, it's open to the public. Uh, they're going to do a giveaway at some point. So there's a chance for that. Give me one sec. We're almost okay. here. Okay, here we are. Oh, nope, not there. Oh. There we are. Awesome. Yes. Okay, right here. There you go. Yeah. So you have 741 members. So, who, you know, that you have a chance of uh, possibly winning something. I'll do that later. Um, but yeah, and then it's just all right in here. Okay, so guys, it's Anime Collectors United, ACU, guys. Right? And I'll pair, if you guys are watching this later on YouTube, I'll put the link down there in the description below. But we also, for the ones watching home that maybe don't want to do that contest and maybe just want to yeah. buy a yeah. autograph directly, I can go ahead and give me one sec. I can go ahead and pull your options right up. So how can the people watching right now just buy a autograph directly from you, Daryl? Uh, you know, just contact me either at my, my sites on um, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram is, is the easiest way till I set things up. Mm -hmm. And then what, what approximately would you uh, generally charge? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm cheap. <laughs> uh, well, for, for mail, just for sending you an autograph, I do 20 bucks. Uh, I'll do a special for you guys, 20 bucks. And if you would like um, uh, even a special message, a uh, 30 second, 60 second message or something as one of my characters, uh, I can do that for you as well for 20. God, guys, that is a steal. And I'm definitely going to grab this one right here. Awesome. But uh, again, guys, all of those links, if you're watching this live on Facebook, going to be right there in the live chat. Or if you're watching this later on YouTube, right down there in the description box below. And with that, we're out of the plug zone and going right into our final segment, viewers, comments, and questions. So like I usually do, guys, I'll just kind of do it about 50-50. Going to take some from the messenger and take some from the live chat. So give me just one sec to bring that up. Whew. Now, I, while I bring that up, Daryl, yes. I want to know, tell me all about Daisy. <laughs> Daisy. Daisy, look. <laughs> okay, this is Daisy. This is my baby. Hey, look. Ah! Can you see her? Okay. Hey, you. What you doing? What you doing? He's like, oh, I'm on TV. You didn't tell me I was going to be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my doggie. Uh, she's a rescue dog, and I, I've had her, gosh, since... 2016, I believe. Oh. So she's great. I mean, I, I, if you don't have a dog and you can rescue a dog, they need good homes. Uh, so she's, and I post a lot of Daisy. <laughs> she's always in my, in my stuff. Because oh, I love, I love every minute of it too. It's my doggy. So, <laughs> All right. so first question is going to come from actually from Raylene who tuned in and wanted to know what is your fav, what was your favorite part in Dorara to play Mikado? Also, who is the best character in Dorara, and why is it Mikado? <laughs> well, Mikado definitely is the best character. Uh, but there are uh, some, you know, some okay ones, too, in there, like um, Isaiah, you know. And I, I kind of like him, too, because he's, he's very strange. You know, I, he's one of those – he's like an enigma, I guess. You know, I, I like him a lot in that. But I, I, there's so many great – that's one, one thing, too, I love about Dorara, is that the amount of – the ensemble work in it and the amount of amazing characters in it. Uh, Mikado is great because he's sort of um, one of the centers, I think, that pivots, the story pivots around. And he, um, so I, I think that's why he's also a great character. And of course, his, when his secret is revealed, I think it makes him um, even more essential. And so what was your favorite part in Dora Rod? Yes. Okay, my favorite parts, uh, there was a few, but uh, just really quickly, I know there was one where he was wearing bunny ears. <laughs> I don't know why, but it was just fun because it was goofy. Uh, and I also love the part, which I can't talk about because it's towards the end of the second season, um, where it just really hits the fan. <laughs> so, and it was just so, so much fun to get into as an actor. And again, we're not talking about any spoilers, guys, but for the love of God, 
watch Dorara. It is yeah. phenomenal. Thank but, you. Uh, okay, and so Nikki tuned in and wanted to know, what did you think about Higurashi when you played uh, Satoshi? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Yes, Satoshi Hojo. Um, I, I love being in that show. Um, the fingernail thing freaks me out if you haven't seen it. Uh, um, I love how it starts off sort of, it's, it's not what it appears to be and then ends up being very dark. So dark. I love those kind. Uh, I just wish, I'll tell you a quick, very quick story when I was doing Satoshi, uh, something happens and then he runs away, leaves. And I asked the director, I said, um, he's coming back, right? And she looks at me. Oof. <laughs> Dang it. All right. Well, a lot of people tuned into the live chat and wanted to say hi. Big fans of you. Thank a couple you. more big fans of Daisy. Yay. <laughs> All right. So, and forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Uh, Sharka tuned in and wanted to know a uh, question for Daryl. Do you think Satoshi from Higurashi will come back and rescue his sister, Satoko? He needs to, because <laughs> I need some work. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would, I, gosh, I mean, he's a popular character, even though he wasn't, he wasn't in all the episodes, but he's a, he's a popular character. So I would love to see him come back. Mm -hmm. you know, just like I would love for Magi, you know, from the Magi, you know, because it kind of was open-ended after the second season. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Calvin tuned in and wanted to know, what are some of your favorite hobbies? Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I am a big outdoor person, so I love just to be outdoors, camping, hiking, uh, traveling anywhere. That's what I love to do. Um, gardening, <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. So, yeah, I write. I, I, I write stuff, too. I write some poetry. I also uh, have written a script, like I said, for an animated series that I'm hoping might do something someday. Uh, so I guess, that, you know, I like to be out there biking, all that kind of stuff. Okay, Sean tuned in and asked kind of a practical question. He wanted to know, what is the best way to get a hold of you for a autograph? So we kind of talked about that. So I guess maybe we'll kind of translate to that. Is there a certain medium that you prefer to be contacted through for that? You know, I'm okay with whatever anyone has. So if you go to my actor page on Facebook, it's uh, Daryl Gilbo Actor. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Twitter. Uh, if you go to, um, I mean, not Twitter, Instagram, if you go to Twitter, it's just Daryl Gilbo, at Daryl Gilbo. So contact me, whatever is easiest for you. Okay, and again, guys, live chat's gonna be in the live chat if you're watching this live or later on YouTube, right there in the description box below. All right, so Monica tuned in and wanted to know, is there anything about being a famous actor slash voice actor that is rough or you find being a, being a problem? Uh, okay, I'm going to preface. I don't consider myself famous. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I guess, <laughs> I guess I just, I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't, cons I have any problems with any of that. <laughs> I mean, when I go to conventions, I know people know me and stuff. So, um, I, I, you know, I've heard people complain about some things, but like, I don't mind when people come up to me and, and, oh, I loved you in this or, or how you did this or whatever. I love it. I'm a very, cause I guess, I don't know. I'm just always been sort of a personable person. So, um, I don't have a problem with any of that, I guess, but I don't know if, I guess I was humongous and the world was, at, you know, if I was like who George Clooney or who's big now, you know, Beyonce or whatever. Yeah. I probably wouldn't want everybody <laughs> well, in front of my house, you know, trying to get in. Well, Monica, thank you for tuning in, and we yes, know the you. truth. We know that Daryl's famous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Sharka actually tuned in again and said, Daryl, there's a manga you might want to check out called Requiem of the, Ro or the Rose Queen. It, or Rose King, my apologies. It's good. All right, cool, I will. Requiem of the Rose King. Ro Requiem of the Rose King. All right. And then, give me one second. Okay. Sarah wanted to know, what are you working on currently that you're extremely excited about? That obviously you can tell us without getting in trouble. Yes. I uh, have that work. <laughs> well, there's, there is a, um, uh, um, an animated show. It's kind of anime, kind of is, I guess. But I can't talk about it because it hasn't come out yet. So I, I can't say anything. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I have a very small little thing in it, but it's uh, Ishida and, I wrote it down because I always forget, Ishida and Asakura. 
uh, a very little small part in it, but it looks so wacky and bizarre. So I think if you, whenever it comes out, I think you'll enjoy watching that. Mm -hmm. And I have a little movie, uh, also coming out, a little independent film. I don't, it's a live action, but I'm playing a priest, a man of the cloth, the first time. <laughs> Bless you all. Come to confession. <laughs> I love it. It's called, it's called Caramel. So I don't Caramel. know. Caramel. Yeah, I don't know when it will be released. All right. So Andre tuned in and wanted to know, did you wish you voiced a character in Cowboy Bebop, Seven Deadly Sins, Kingdom Hearts, <laughs> and Persona 4? Yes, <laughs> yes. I I auditioned for uh, Seven Deadly Sins, and but I I didn't book anything in it. Robbery. <laughs> All righty, guys, and then we got time for about one more question. Pull it from the messenger real quick. Okay, so. I like your phone case. Kevin, oh, thank you, thank you. My mom got it for me. Mom, if you're watching this, thank you. <laughs> All right, so Kevin tuned in and is going to round us out. He wanted to know, what is your favorite character or characters that you find don't get as much credit as you think they deserve? Oh, you know, it's how funny, because I was just kind of thinking that in my head. Uh, there's a, a little known one called Melody of Oblivion, and I just love the character I play in that named Hikari. Um, also, uh, oh gosh, Riko Nura and Nura Rise of the Yokai Clan. I like playing him a lot too. Um, uh, Paranoia Agent, I have a small role in that, but it's a fun part because he gets to have a, a, a nervous breakdown uh, in his episode. Mm -hmm. uh, Morobito, Guardian of the Spirit, a character named Tandor that I have one, one episode in, but it was a lot of, a lot of fun. And I tell you, every the two episodes of Samurai Shampoo, episode three and four. Oh my God. Morobito, Guardian of the Spirit, one of my favorite animes of all time, oh, and I'm glad I'm not. I'm glad I'm not the only person who uh, thinks that. Yeah, it's draw. It's it, the animation's gorgeous. You know? Oh my god! And, the story. and like, yeah. Full full disclosure. I was totally going to talk to you about Tandor, but I figured nobody would know. Nice. Because, because and uh, quick story. So we had Steve Staley on uh, yeah a couple episodes ago, and he of course voices uh, Shuga from Morbito Garden of the Spirit. And yeah. I told him before uh, we went live, like hey, really big fan of you as Shuga from Morbid of the Garden Spirit. He's like, oh, thanks, man. What was that show? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, just rip my heart out while you're at it. But uh, okay, actually, I'll ha make time for one more question. We got tuned in, Christina tuned in and wanted to ask, what characters have been some of your most favorite to play and any least favorite roles that you've had? Oh, well, definitely, you know, Mikado, and I mean, the ones we've talked about, uh, but also in uh, video games, I've, I did Marvel, um, Beautiful Joe and Marvel vs. Capcom and um, uh, Lael and Final Fantasy, Crystal Chronicles, Crystal Bears, uh, stuff like that, Sush Sushu and Dynasty Warriors. But in the anime, uh, it's so hard. There's only really one I had a problem with, and it was only because I had to pitch the voice so high, it was painful. And it was a, one called, it was, the first one I ever did, actually, and it was a smaller role, but it's called Stelvia. If anyone's ever, and I played the little little kid brother, and I and I, it was like, okay, I'm not doing anything this high again. <laughs> it was just difficult because just the pitching that voice just it was like, okay, that's too young. Oh so. my god, <laughs> guys! With that, that's about all the time we got for VisionCon Live episode 40. So, ladies and gentlemen, this has been looking out the window. Get out the window, girl. <laughs> She's like spying. Something's going on out there. Sure. <laughs> Episode 40 of Vision Gone Live. Before we wrap things up, Daryl, any final thoughts to leave us on? Words of wisdom, anything? Uh, hey, everybody, just really stay safe out there. We all know the coronavirus is going around. Please wear your masks. Um, and I just want to wish everybody well. And the holidays are coming. Happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, uh, all that wonderful stuff. And I hope 2021 is going to be a, a great year for everyone because we deserve a better year. Uh, couldn't have ended it better myself. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been episode 40 of VisionCon Live. Thank you so much for tuning in. Of course, I'm your host, Zach Wilson. But much more importantly, this has been my very special guest, Daryl Gilbo. Make sure to check out all the links down in the description box below. And until next time, guys, always remember that life's better when you have friends to share it with.